evening. It's wonderful to see you here. My name is Jay Garfield, and I'm one of the cast of thousands um, coordinating the Putting Pen to Palm Leaf series, um, to which I welcome you. This is the second um, set of events in this series, which is a series investigating the relationship between Buddhism and contemporary literature. A few weeks ago, we were blessed to have Norman Fisher here with us for almost two weeks. Um, over these weeks, we have our own Ruth Ozeki visiting us from here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in the spring, we will be enjoying extended visits from Kate Lila Wheeler, who will be with us for two weeks, and Jane Hirschfield uh, for one week. Um, these are, excuse me? Jane for one week. For one week, yes. Um, so these are um, remarkable events in a remarkable series. Each of our visitors, including with the visitor once again, I don't know how to do this <laughs> linguistically, um, does a pub gives a public reading, a public lecture, as Ruth is doing tonight. Her reading was at Amherst last week. Um, it's part of an extended Khan Institute for a group of faculty members from the five colleges who are attending, does a five college Buddhist studies faculty seminar, a seminar for students, and often makes class visits that are working these people to death. Um, <laughs> and this is the right way to bring people, to allow the community to really interact in a number of ways with extremely distinguished uh, writers whose work is inflected by Buddhism. Um, whenever you're doing something this large, there's a cast, a large cast of characters who are helping to support that. And I want to acknowledge those people now. This um, visit is co-sponsored by Five College Buddhist Studies, um, Smith, uh, a number of people at Smith College, um, Amherst College, and Hampshire College. So at Smith, I want to thank the, um, the Lecture Fund, which has been very generous in supporting this, the Ada Howe Kent Fund, the Provost Office, which has helped us, the Department of English, the Department of Comparative Literature, and the Buddhist Studies Program. The Amherst College Religion Department is also a generous sponsor at, Hampshire's Col at Hampshire College. The School of Critical Social Inquiry has helped support this, and we've received do a generous donation from Five Colleges Incorporated. Without this kind of generous funding, there's no way that anything like this would happen. And it's always worth remembering whenever you attend an event like this, there's a lot of people in the background helping. In particular, I also want to acknowledge uh, Phoebe McKinnell, who's done uh, almost all of the administrative work for this program. Ruth has been a helper in planning this, including planning her own visit. <laughs> Andy Rockman, who's um, <laughs> languishing in India right now. Jamie Hubbard, Maria Heim, um, Sue Darlington, and Suzanne Rosick, all of whom have been involved in, um, in putting this uh, series of events together. Um, I, it's really one of the wonderful things about doing this is you begin to recognize, or I begin to recognize, uh, the wonderful community that we're in, where we've got a number of colleagues who are willing to put their time, their effort, their thought, and their care into putting uh, together an event like this, and we're lucky to have the resources to make that happen. Whenever you do something like this, you kind of remember the, how much we depend on generosity, and interdependence, and that's just a good thing to recall at a time like this. So much for the series itself. I uh, now want to say a few words about Ruth before I turn it over to, to, uh, to her. Uh, Ruth is the Grace Jarcho Ross, 1933, Professor of Humanities and Professor of Creative Writing here at Smith College. She is a double Smith alumna as well, <laughs> having graduated with a legitimate degree in 1990. <laughs> 1980. 80. 1980. 80. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Long time ago. And then a, a, an honorary doctorate uh, from Smith in 2006, a well-deserved honorary doctorate. There's a whole lot of stuff that everybody knows about Ruth and that everybody says every time they introduce Ruth. So I'm not going to mention any of that. I won't <laughs> mention my year of meets. I won't mention a tale for the time being, or the fact that it won the 2014 Energy Book Club Prize, or the fact that it was awarded the Sunburst Award for Excellence in Canadian Literature in 2014. I will not tell you that it won the LA Times Book Prize, or that it was shortlisted for the Booker. I will, however, so I won't mention any of those things. I will, however, mention the fact, um, and this is the one that I love the most, that it won the Yasnaya Polanya Award for Best Foreign Literature in Russia. That's an award given by the Tolstoy Family Foundation. And that's really, really cool. <laughs> um, and 
mention the other award that I will mention, because it's one that, again, I find people who don't know about this. Um, is the Dos Passos Award, oh, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. extraordinary. And in particular, I want to read a little bit of the citation for the Dos Passos Award. Um, it, it recognizes a tale for the time being for being an intense original exploration of American themes, an experimental approach to form, and evincing an interest in a variety of human experience. All of that's true, and all of that's impressive, and those are the kinds of things that can hear uh, Ruth's work and Ruth to most of us. There's other stuff that maybe you don't know. That, uh, Ruth <laughs> this Ruth is Ruth where Ruth I leave. <laughs> that she's a, a producer in Japanese television, and that she made low-budget horror movies when she got started. <laughs> um, but other people don't know that she has a, a serious filmmaking career. I mean, a lot of people actually know that stuff because it's you know fun. But she also has a serious uh, filmmaking career. Um, Body of Correspondence won the New Visions Award at the San Francisco Film Festival, and Having the Bones which is a, a fabulous film, was shown at Sundance. Uh, Ruth is also a Zen priestess. And one of the things that I love about her work, one of the many things that I love about her work, are that books like Face, the, the Time Code book, and um, Tale for the Time Being, can easily be read as commentarial literature on canonical Buddhist literature. So a Tale for the Time Being, I mean, some people think of it as a novel. I think of it as an extended commentary on Dogen Uji and Genjo Koan. And when I teach those texts, I often refer <coughs> to Ruth's novel as a, an, an important commentary on those texts. And Face is a kind of complicated commentary on a whole lot of stuff happening um, in Buddhist literature, not only in Zen, but in, uh, in much earlier traditions, on selflessness, on representation, on impermanence and all of the wonderful things that we like to think about and pretend don't happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> most important to me, um, beyond Ruth's enormous accomplishments, um, is the fact that she is an extraordinary teacher, and I've benefited from her teaching, an extraordinary colleague, um, and a superb contributor to the world of Buddhist studies and literature in the Valley. And that's kind of what I love most about <laughs> she, uh, Even if she never wrote any of that stuff, just having her here <laughs> as a colleague would make it all worthwhile. So tonight she's going to talk to us about the contemplative on Zen and the art of autobiographical fiction with us. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Oh, hi. So, hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming on this beautiful, um, beautiful Monday. Monday? Yeah. Monday. <laughs> Apologies to the Monday meditators. We had to cancel meditation so that I could stand here and talk. In meditation, we don't talk. Here we talk. So, um, so I want to start, though, because this is 5 o'clock and I'm conditioned to meditate on Mondays at 5. Um, I'd like to start by asking you all to close your eyes. Wow, did you hear that? That was the sound of eyes closing. <laughs> that was amazing. Okay. okay, close your eyes. And in your imagination, uh, project yourself up here into my body. And so we're standing here, and we can feel our heart pumping pretty hard. We can feel tension in our shoulders, so it's good to relax that. We can feel tension in our faces. So we can relax that as well. We notice that the breathing is a little shallow. So we can take a deep breath. And now we're beginning to notice the feeling of the ground underneath our feet, which is, which is good because a moment ago, there was no ground under our feet, and now there is. And we can feel the 
podium underneath our hands. Palms a little sweaty. Definitely feeling some kind of nervousness, but as time passes, we're beginning to wonder if maybe this isn't excitement instead. So that's kind of interesting. What's the difference? OK, so thank you. Now we can all open our eyes. And so now you know what it feels like to be me. <laughs> and I assure you that it won't always feel this way, um, but it feels this way right now. And, and it is a funny word in that sentence. Um, it feels this way. It doesn't feel this way. Um, it's a funny word. Um, grammatically, it is called a dummy subject or, um, or an empty subject, right? That pronoun, it. Um, and it's standing in for I, right? That it is standing in for I. It doesn't feel, I feel. I feel. Or rather, I felt. Because that was how I felt a moment ago, and now I feel different already. So, well, hang on, let me. Yeah, definitely different now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, the feelings are changing and dissipating, and they're changing all the time, right? And anyway, these are all just words. They're sounds coming from my mouth. They're not really my feelings nor are they your feelings, but somehow, anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, when I teach creative writing, the first thing I do is to teach writers how to meditate. And then after that, we begin every class with a short meditation. We spend a few moments sitting quietly, with our eyes closed, tuning in to our bodies and our breath, and noticing the feeling of being a living, breathing body. It's because we're all living, breathing bodies that you know what I mean. Uh, sometimes I'll direct the writers to bring their awareness to their senses, or what in Buddhism is called the sense gates. And we notice what sensations are entering our bodies through these gates. Now in the West, we usually think of ourselves as having five senses, right? Sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, whose corresponding sense gates are the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue and the skin, or the body. The sense gates are a part of the body, and the body, we think, is separate and different from the mind. In Eastern thought, and certainly in Buddhism, uh, there is no such separation. In fact, Buddhism teaches that there are six senses, and the sixth sense gate is the mind. Okay? And through this sense gate of the mind, we experience the sensation of thoughts and feelings. This means that a thought or an emotion is equivalent to a smell or a taste, just a, an ephemeral phenomenon. And I find this both interesting and, and also somewhat of a relief. You know, here in the West, we take our thoughts and our ideas and our emotions so seriously as if they are really something, right? And it's a relief to think that my anxiety is as ephemeral as a bad smell. <laughs> In meditation, we study our thoughts and our feelings and our bodily sensations, watching them come and go without trying to stop them or push them away, but also without grabbing onto them and being carried away either. We train ourselves to become aware of the transient currents of our consciousness. We sit and watch with gentle curiosity. Now, meditation is different from what writers do, but not entirely different. I teach writers to meditate because the senses, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, as well as thoughts and feelings, are the raw material for everything that we write. From this surging, inchoate, and ever-changing ebb and flow of experience, we draw our words and stories, translate them into images, and transcribe them onto the page. And we can do this because we have a body-mind. And readers can read our words and respond to them because they have body minds too. This is why literature works. Literature exists because writers can express the experience of their body mind in a way that allows readers to receive it with their body minds and be moved by it. 
So it stands to reason that training our awareness of our body-mind will lead us to become better writers. And that was for the students, for my students in the class. <laughs> Just reminding them of the value of this. So the title of this talk today is The Contemplative Eye, Zen and the Art of Autobiographical Fiction. And today I want to talk about my practice as a Zen Buddhist and also about my practice as a writer of autobiographical fiction, um, which is sometimes called autofiction, um, which is a term I don't much like because it sounds like novels about cars. <laughs> but it also sounds like a contraction of automatic fiction. And this is interesting. Um, fiction writing, at least to my experience, is not automatic, certainly not in the sense of being mechanical. But the word comes from the Greek, automatos, meaning acting of itself. And when the writing is going well, that's exactly what it feels like. So uh, since I'm going to talk about autobiographical fiction, I thought I'd start by telling you a little bit about myself. My name is Jane Takagi Little. Little was my dad, a little from Quam, Minnesota. Takagi is my mother's name. She's Japanese. Hyphenation may be a modern response to patriarchal naming practices in some cases, but not in mine. My hyphen is a thrust of pure superstition. At my christening, Ma was stricken with a profound oriental dread at the thought of her child bearing an insignificant surname like Little through life, so at the very last minute she insisted on attaching hers. Takagi is a big name, literally, comprising the Chinese character for tall and the character for tree. Ma thought the stature and eminence of her lofty ancestors would help equalize Dad's little. <laughs> they were always fighting about stuff like this. It doesn't mean anything, Dad would say. It's just a name, which would cause Ma to recoil in horror. Mm -hmm. How can you say just a name? Name is very fast to sing. Name is face to all the world. Jane represents their despair at ever reaching an interesting compromise. In spite of the little, my dad was a tall man, and I'm just under six feet myself. <laughs> in Japan, this makes me a freak. After living there for a while, I simply gave up trying to fit in. I cut my hair short, dyed chunks of it green, and spoke in men's Japanese. It suited me. Polysexual, polyracial, perverse, I towered over the sleek uniform heads of commuters on the Tokyo subway. Ironically, the real culture shock occurred when I left Japan and moved here to New York, to the East Village. Suddenly, everyone looked weird, just like me. <laughs> so, well, obviously that's not true. <laughs> My name isn't Jane Takagi Little. My name is Ruth Ozeki. But that's not true either. Ozeki is a pen name. I made it up. But that's not true either. <laughs> I didn't make it up. I stole the name from a Japanese guy I met back in 1977 during a blackout in a YMCA in Rangoon, Burma, as Myanmar was known back then. I was backpacking around Asia and got stuck at the Rangoon YMCA because the Shan State insurgents in the north had shut down the train to Mandalay. I'd run out of Burmese currency, and this Japanese guy told me that he would exchange some money for me on the black market. He was kind of cute, so I gave him $50. Two hours later, he came back empty-handed and said he'd been robbed in an alleyway during the exchange. <laughs> I didn't believe him. But I was young, so we ended up traveling together around India for a while. And, <laughs> and in a casino in Kathmandu, I discovered that he had a gambling problem. <laughs> Eventually, I, this is what I did on my year off, by the way, <laughs> from Smith. Eventually, I broke up with him, but I took his name, Ozeki. It's a good name. It's kind of snappy. Um, now, he is a multimillionaire with a well-known fashion brand and stores in Shinjuka, Shinjuku and Shibuya and Harajuku. Uh, and I'm a novelist <laughs> named Ozeki. And this is a true story, but, and there's more to it, but I'll stop there. Here's another true story. I was born in 1956. Ever since I was a very little kid, I loved to read, and I knew I wanted to be a writer. I grew up reading novels by dead white men, Hemingway, Faulkner, Fitzgerald, or by even longer dead white women, 
Louisa May Alcott, Jane Austen, the Brontes. Naturally, I thought novelists had to be dead white Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> and the heroes of novels had to be white Anglo-Saxons, too. White Anglo-Saxon was the predominant literary archetype available when I was a kid. And it was the only one I recognized as authentic. As a would-be novelist, this posed a big problem, namely that I wasn't white and I wasn't dead. I didn't feel entitled to write novels, and certainly not the kind of big, sprawling novels that I love to read. And there were no mainstream Asian American writers when I was a kid. To give you some context, Maxine Hong Kingston's nonfiction book, War Women Warrior, was published in 1976, when I was 20. Joy Luck Club by Amy Tan was the, really the first big novel by an Asian American to break out on the bestseller lists, and it was published in 1989 when I was 33. So when I was in the fifth grade, I remember thinking really seriously about this problem and coming up with a solution. Um, if I couldn't write novels, then I would write in one of the few narrative forms I felt ethnically and racially entitled to. I would write haiku. As a young Japanese-American girl, I could totally own haiku. <laughs> and this was a great idea until I actually sat down and tried to write one. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not a poet. <laughs> I'm a novelist. I was verbose and hyper, uh, hyperbolic even back then. And the task of compressing my thoughts into 19 spare syllables proved impossible. Um, and too, as a mixed-race kid, I was obsessed with authenticity. How, as an Asian American girl, could I write authentically literary novels? Authentic literary characters were white. How could I write authentically from the perspective of a white person? Who would believe me? In grade school and then in high school, and even as a college student here at Smith, I struggled with these questions and found no answers, which pretty much put a stop to my writing for the next 20 years. It took me until I was 40 to find a voice and a narrative form. And when I did, I found myself writing novels about hyphenated, half-Japanese, half-American characters who were verbose, hyperbolic, opinionated, <laughs> angry, <laughs> political, irreverent, and, and sometimes even funny. Okay. This was something that Asian girls were not allowed to be when I was little. We could be smart, sexy, cute, inscrutable, studious, good at math. We could play the violin, but we could never be funny. We weren't allowed to be funny until Margaret Cho showed us how. <laughs> My half-Japanese, half-American characters were like proxies or surrogate selves, and I wrote them in order to investigate the deeply rooted questions of racial and cultural identity that I had been grappling with all my life. The first half-Japanese, half-American character I wrote was Jane Takagi Little in My Year of Meats. And as soon as I started writing her, I realized I had a problem. Jane was half Japanese, half American. I'm half Japanese, half American. Jane was a documentary filmmaker. I had been a documentary filmmaker. But that was pretty much it. Aside from our shared mixed race heritage and a job description, we were different. I knew she was fictional, right? I knew she wasn't me. But would a reader be able to tell us apart? This is a problem that I, ex I suspect uh, white male authors do not have. When a white guy writes a novel about a white guy, readers do not automatically assume that the fictional character is autobiographical. This is the benefit of sharing an identity with a literary archetype. Archetypes are, by nature, somewhat generic. Their identity transcends the personal. But my identity was too specific and too identifiable. If I wrote about half Japanese, half American women, readers were automatically going to assume excuse me, assume that this character was autobiographical. And I get this. You know, it can't, it can't be helped. So I decided to play with it by making Jane six feet tall and giving her green hair so that readers could tell us apart. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. <laughs> People still got us mixed up. And after the book was published, one of my very best friends st often, s she just started slipping and calling me Jane. And this <laughs> happened over and over and over again. She was one of my closest friends. So this was embarrassing, right? Um, Jane Takagi Little was a product of my wishful thinking. Um, I, I wished that I was six feet tall. I wished that I had green hair. 
My Year of Meats was an attempt to work out a thorny tangle of ethical questions I'd faced when working for the global meat industry and commercial television. And Jane faces versions of these same questions. I wish I had the wits and courage to do what she did in the novel. All of this to say that Jane ended up becoming somewhat of a superhero character. And, and I'm not a superhero, and, and it was awkward when people got us mixed up. So in my next novel, All Over Creation, I decided to make the mixed race protagonist, Yumi Fuller, so deeply flawed and screwed up and unreliable that no one would dare suggest that she was me. <laughs> Clever, right? <laughs> so that didn't work either. <laughs> Readers still mistook Yumi for me, which was again embarrassing, but to be honest, they weren't wrong to do so. Yumi wasn't mean, wasn't me, but she wasn't not me either. And the same holds true for Jane. In fact, the same holds true for all of my fictional characters, not just the mixed race protagonist. As I taught myself to write novels, I began to realize that any character I could possibly imagine, heroes and villains alike, were aspects or facets of what I experience as myself. What else could they be, right? I mean, yes, they come from my imagination, but what's the source of that imagination if not my own life and personal experience? This makes writing villain characters particularly interesting. <laughs> when you're writing villains, you're revealing to the world the darkest aspects of self. But oddly, I've found my villains don't give me too much trouble. The hardest characters to write were the ones most obviously autobiographical, like Jane Takagi Little or Yumi Fuller. And I guess it makes sense that they would give me the most trouble because they're most like me, right? <laughs> I remember getting uh, early feedback on my year of meets from my wonderful editor at the time, Carol DeSanti, who is class of 81, who was sitting right there. And, and Carol told me that she found Jane a bit too prickly <laughs> and kind of unpleasant. <laughs> and couldn't I soften her up a little bit? It's like, oh my god, I wish, right? I've been, that, that's, been my life, that's been my life goal, to soften up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And my struggle with Yumi was even worse. Um, All Over Creation is a novel about power and control, and I thought I needed a godlike, omniscient narrator. But Yumi had other ideas. Um, she wanted to be the narrator. Um, and so we had this huge battle of wills until finally I gave in, um, which is what a writer must do when a character is dead set on doing something. So this idea that all characters are facets of self is not something you want to think about too much when you're actually writing fiction, because that's when your inner critic kicks in and starts saying things like, no, Ruth, really, just stop. <laughs> right? Do you really want people to know that's what's going on in your mind? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> go, go get a real job. <laughs> but thankfully, the English language has provided us with a label that we can hide behind, and that label is fiction. It's like our safe word, fiction. <laughs> and it allows us writers some plausible de deniability. You know, oh, oh, that's not true. I just made that up. But really, what is more personal and intimate and revealing than sharing the contents of your fantasy life and your imagination? In a recent New York Times interview, the Japanese novelist Haruki Murakami was talking about the fiction writer's relationship with the self. The interviewer asked him, your books are full of the surreal and the fantastical. Is your life like that too? And he replied, I'm a realistic person, a practical person, but when I write fiction, I go to weird, secret places in myself. What I'm doing is an exploration of myself, inside myself. If you close your eyes and dive into yourself, you can see a different world. It's like exploring the cosmos, but inside yourself. You go to a different place where it's very dangerous and scary, and it's important to know your way back. So even for a surrealist, fantastical, speculative fiction writer like Murakami, the self is the starting point for fiction. And of course, many other writers talk about this, uh, this as well. Um, Milan Kundera wrote, um, the characters in my novels are my own unrealized possibilities. That is why I'm equally fond of them all and equally horrified by them. Each one has crossed a border that I myself have circumvented. And I really agree with this. OK, so I want to go back to something that I said um, about how the idea 
for my year of meets <coughs> grew out of a thorny tangle of ethical questions. So one of the writers in my workshop this semester posted this question on our class Moodle. I am inspired by philosophical ideas that I think could be conveyed in story form. And then I look for a story that can be a vehicle for that idea. But I worry that this approach hinders me from producing stories that are highly readable and enjoyable. How important is it to prioritize writing a story for the story's sake first, and then let philosophical contents be sort of a side effect? Is the, quote, right approach just highly relative to the particular writer? Or is there a quite objectively right approach? Okay. So this is, this is such a great question. And um, I want to try to answer it. Um, I, I do think that the right approach is highly relative. And every writer has their own way of telling a story and their own reasons for doing so. I mean, I've heard that some writers even do it for the money, which is amazing. <laughs> um, but, for me, writing is my way of thinking. And my novels uh, come from questions or problems that I'm grappling with in my life. Some of these questions are philosophical. Some are political. Often, they are ethical. But they are always personal. Um, so in my year of meets, in addition to the questions of race and culture, which were kind of personal questions, I was trying to understand the ethics of working in commercial media, making TV shows that promoted the meat industry, whose practices I found highly problematic. I was thinking about how something as public and political as an FDA decision to approve a pharmaceutical for market could affect something as profoundly personal as the descent of an egg through a woman's fallopian tube. As I mentioned, All Over Creation is a book about power. When I was writing that book, I was trying to understand the control we humans try to ex uh, exert over nature and natural processes, like birth and death and plants and animals. Writing the book was a way of engaging with the political and ethical questions surrounding the issue of genetically engineered organisms, questions that I found confusing and frightening. But in the book, I was also trying to understand and comes to come to terms with the rage and grief I felt when my father died. In many ways, All Over Creation was the most personal book I've ever written. And as second wave feminism has taught us, the personal is the political. Novel writing is an inquiry, and I think it's the, deep, and I think it's the deeply personal and pressing nature of that inquiry that animates the character and the story. And I should mention, too, that the inquiry is open-ended. Through the process of writing, I'm engaging with problems and testing propositions, but not necessarily in trying to solve them or come up with definitive answers. And this is important. Novels are a collaborative endeavor, right? something that writers and readers do together. So to tie up those questions or to insist on a single um, solution, my solution, would be to shut the reader out of the process. It's the open-endedness of the inquiry that makes novels readable instead of didactic. At least, that's my hope. OK. So I've talked about um, the experience of, experiences of self, of political and personal identity, as being central to fiction writing. How does this map onto the Buddhist view of, of self? Well, one of the central tenets of Buddhism is the doctrine of anatta, a word that can be translated as no self. Buddhist philosophy holds that there's no unchanging, permanent self or soul. Personal identity is ultimately ungraspable. And there's no abiding essence in anything, person, being, or phenomenon. Uh, anatta, this, this no self, along with two other tenets, um, anika, um, which is impermanence, and dukkha, which is uh, suffering or unsatisfactoriness, right? um, these, these three tenants make up what's called the three marks of existence. And simply put, the three marks describe existence as a continually changing state of dependent causation, wherein all phenomena, everything, every being, including us, arises as a result of a complex set of contingencies, causes, and conditions, described as interdependence, interconnectedness, dependent origination, or dependent co-arising. There's many words to describe this. Thich Nhat Hanh calls this interbeing. Okay? And the condition of the, our lives is that we inter-are. Okay? So a metaphor that's often used uh, to describe this is that of the wave, a wave. Okay? So now, imagine you're some seawater right? hanging out in the great, big, undifferentiated ocean. 
Now, all of a sudden, the right combination of currents, winds, and tides come along and thrusts you up. And, and there you are, right? Wearing your little white cap. <laughs> and you poke your head up and you look around and you think, wow, look at me. I'm a wave. Look how much taller I am than all this water surrounding me. And I'm faster and bigger, too. And oh my god, the surfers love me. <laughs> wait, wait, what's happening? Oh no! And then before you know it, you sink down again and become part of that undifferentiated ocean. There is no fixed identity that the wave can call me or myself. But of course, the wave doesn't like that. The wave wants to last. It wants fixity, permanence, independence from the rest of the ocean. It wants to be a subject in relation to the object, the sea surrounding it. It wants to be, in Kant's metaphor, a subject at the center of a phenomenal universe, or, as Wittgenstein put it, as the eye with respect to the visual field. I I'm cribbing here from Jay Garfield's book, Engaging Buddhism, Why It Matters to Philosophy. The little wave doesn't know any of this, however, because it hasn't read Jay's book. <laughs> It, it doesn't know, it doesn't know uh, that it is suffering from what he so aptly calls a primal confusion about the nature of reality and the mistaken belief in a fixed self, in an abiding I. Instead, the little wave makes up stories about who it is and how it is separate from the ocean and taller or bigger or faster than all the other waves. And then desperately gra grasping on to that fiction of a fixed abiding self, it suffers. The, first, uh, the Canadian First Nation writer, uh, Thomas King, once wrote, the truth about stories is that that's all we are. Buddhism would agree. The I is a fiction. We are the stories we tell ourselves. We are tales for the time being. As a fiction writer, this is kind of perfect. <laughs> so when I, started, uh, when I first started writing and practicing Zen, the two seemed like very different activities. But as the years passed, they seemed to have merged. Um, I've come to experience fiction writing as a way of uh, interrogating and deconstructing the notion of a fixed self and of performing Buddhist teachings like no self primal confusion, and dependent, dependent co-arising. Um, I was playing with this in my most recent novel, A Tale for the Time Being, which is the most overtly Buddhistic of all of my novels. Uh, the inspiration for the novel, um, as Jay mentioned, came from a fascicle I was studying by my favorite 13th century Buddhist sage, Dogen Zenji. Um, uh, Dogen Zenji is my favorite because he was a writer. <laughs> Most religious sages don't write. They talk and they teach and other people write down you know, what they've said and this is how uh, religious canons emerge. But Dogen was unique. He left behind volumes of writing, both formal and informal, including essays and scriptural commentaries and in, in, you know, instruction manuals and, and lots of poetry, both in Japanese and also in Chinese. He was a radical thinker and a kind of 13th century postmodernist turning stories and narratives inside out and upside down and problematizing everything. The fascicle I was reading is called Uji, written in October 2040. The word Uji has been translated into English in a number of ways. Um, being time, time being, some moments, some time, and even the theory of time. Okay. I was reading Kaz Tanahashi's translation, and he translated it as the time being. So this phrase was interesting, and it kind of stuck in my mind. It's an unstable phrase, because its meaning changes depending on your inflection. If you put the emphasis on the second word, the time being, then it means temporarily, or, or for now. But if you put the emphasis on the first word, the time being, then it suggests a being, like a human being or an alien being, and an entity made of time, like the Time Lords on Doctor Who. As I was reading this essay, Uji, every time, uh, and I was reading it in, in, uh, in English, as I was reading the essay, every time I came across the phrase, I'd kind of stumble across it, sometimes reading it one way for the time being, and other times reading it the other way for the time being. And the phrase seemed to be sort of resisting a singular interpretation, and this instability was like a loose tooth wiggling in my mouth. I kept worrying it, but it refused to settle. It felt like the phrase had a will or spirit of its own wanting to come to life. And this was back in 2002. Four years later, in, 2000, in December of 2006, a voice came into my head. It was the voice of a young Japanese schoolgirl who introduced herself and said, 
Hi. My name is Nao, and I'm a time being. Do you know what a time being is? Well, if you give me a moment, I will tell you. A time being is someone who lives in time, and that means you and me and every one of us who is or was or ever will be. As for me right now, I'm sitting in a French maid cafe in Akiba Electricity Town, listening to a sad chanson that's playing sometime in your past, which is also my present, writing this and wondering about you somewhere in my future. And if you're reading this, then maybe by now you're wondering about me too. You wonder about me. I wonder about you. So this seemed promising. Right? <laughs> Novels often come to me as voices. And as soon as I heard Nao's voice, I knew certain things about her. I knew that she was a junior high school student. Um, it was sitting in this maid cafe in Tokyo, writing in a diary. Um, I knew she was troubled and possibly even suicidal. Um, but she also had a kind of an attitude and a quirky sense of humor, uh, which seemed to point to an inner source of strength. I knew she was writing in English, which was odd, because why would a Japanese schoolgirl be writing in English? And it was clear, too, that she was writing to someone, which was odd, because normally we don't write diaries for other people to read. But now, definitely had a reader in mind. Um, she had all the confidence of a young writer kind of casting her words out into the world, certain that someone would be there to receive them, and knowing that when that happened, something magical would occur. The problem was that now didn't know who her reader was, and so neither did I. As a novelist, it was my job then to answer this question, who is Now's reader? And this took five years. During this time, Now's story emerged. It turned out that her father was a computer interface designer who had been headhunted by a gaming startup in Silicon Valley, so Now had grown up in Sunnyvale, California. When she was 14, her father lost his job through mysterious circumstances, and the family was forced to move back to Tokyo. Now's mother supported the family while her father became a recluse, spending his days folding elaborate origami insects to stave off thoughts of suicide. Now was put into a Japanese junior high school where she was the target of bullying so terrible she felt she had no choice but to commit suicide too. But before she ended her life, she was determined to do one last act of redemption, to tell the fascinating life story of her 104-year-old great-grandmother, old Jiko, who is a Zen Buddhist nun. Now, I should mention, too, that old Jiko isn't just any old 104-year-old Zen Buddhist nun. She's a 104-year-old anarchist feminist Zen Buddhist nun. Okay. And old Jiko was now his only friend and really the only reliable adult that she knew. So now sets out to write down old Jiko's fascinating story in the pages of her diary, but of course being 16 years old, she soon finds her own life far more fascinating, and she keeps getting distracted. So meanwhile, as all of this was happening, I continued to search for the character of Now's reader. Uh, the process was a bit like casting an actor for a role in a film. Um, I'd think of a character and invite him into the fictional world. I'd arrange for him to find the diary, maybe in a library or a coffee shop. He'd read the diary and he'd react, now would respond, and slowly the fictional world would start to grow, getting all round and plump and promising. And months would pass, and then one morning I'd open the manuscript and find that the world had gone flat, like a burst balloon. And that's when I would realize that I had the wrong reader. So I'd usher him out, and then after a suitable period of grieving, um, another reader would come to mind, maybe a woman this time, and I'd invite her into the fictional world and start the whole process all over again. So I repeated this process three or four times over as many years, and started three or four different versions of the book, each with a different character cast as the reader. Some were young, some were old, some were male, some were female, some were in between. And each time with each reader, Now's story would get a little bit longer, right? And finally, at the end of 2011, I managed to finish a draft of the book. The draft was completely different from this book, from the, you know, from this book that got published. Now was still Now, but her reader was an odd, amorphous character with no name, no gender, no job, and a nonspecific and undiagnosable illness. <laughs> <laughs> who spent all their time in a library, okay? It was a terrible draft, um, but it was done. 
right? So I gave it to my agent who agreed that it was a terrible <laughs> draft, but um, she wanted to submit it to Carol anyway, hoping that Carol would be able to fix it. Um, so I was cleaning it up and preparing it for submission um, when on March 11th, the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami struck Japan. Okay. And I'll never forget watching those horrifying images of the wave obliterating towns and villages along the coastline and washing them out to sea. I have friends and family in Tokyo and in Sendai, and my first concern was for them, but when the meltdown at Fukushima nuclear reactor occurred, my worry turned global. The world was a different place, Japan was a different place, and it hit me then that the novel I'd written was no longer relevant. Certain catastrophic events create a rift, dividing time into before and after. 9-11 was like that. For a while after 9-11, fiction writers couldn't write about New York because we didn't know what New York was anymore. The same was true for Japan. I'd written a pre-earthquake, pre-tsunami, pre-Fukushima book, and we were now living in a post-earthquake, post-tsunami, post-Fukushima world. So I couldn't go forward with the book. I told my ag agent I would not be submitting it, and um, I figured that was pretty much the end of it. Months passed, but Nao's voice just kept coming back and wouldn't leave me alone. I talked this over with my husband, Oliver, and he made a suggestion. He pointed out that the devastating reality of the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear meltdown had broken the world. And it had certainly broken the fictional world of my novel. The only way forward then was to acknowledge this brokenness. And the way to do this was to step into the novel myself as a character, okay, a real person in a fiction. Um, and this would break down the seamless illusion of a fictional world and allow it to stay broken. So now as reader had to be me. And the earthquake and tsunami and nuclear meltdown, these awful catastrophic but very real factors, had to become part of the story. Um, so Oliver was right about this. And I pointed out to him that uh, you know, if I were going to be in the book, then he would have to be in the book too. <laughs> <laughs> and thankfully, he agreed. He said, it, he, he said he thought it would be an interesting thought experiment. So the initial draft that I, was, that I had not you know, the, the first draft of the book was about 700 pages long, written in alternating chapters between now and this nameless reader. Um, basically, what I did was I unzipped the manuscript and threw out all of the reader's chapter, chapters and the ending of the book, which was about, this was about two-thirds of the manuscript, about 400 pages that I threw out. And I started over again. And this time, Now's diary washes up on the beach on a, the far side of the Pacific Ocean on a remote island off the coast of Canada where it's discovered by a reader whose name is Ruth. And I'll just read uh, just a couple sentences from Ruth so you can hear um, who she is. A tiny sparkle caught Ruth's eye, a small glint of refracted sunlight angling out from beneath a massive tangle of drying bull kelp which the sea had heaved up onto the sand at full tide. She mistook it for the sheen of a dying jellyfish and almost walked right by it. The beaches were overrun with jellyfish these days, the monstrous red stinging kind that looked like wounds along the shoreline. But something made her stop. She leaned over and nudged the heap of kelp with the toe of her sneaker and then poked it with a stick. Untangling the whip-like fronds, she dislodged enough to see that what glistened underneath was not a dying sea jelly, but something plastic, a bag. Not surprising, the ocean was full of plastic, etc. Okay, so that's that's Ruth, um, and Ruth assumes then that this bag that contains the you know she she discovers the the diary inside this bag. She assumes that this is all part of the the quote debris field that got washed out to sea after the 2011 Japanese uh, earthquake and tsunami. Um, she starts to read Now's diary and becomes obsessed with the girl's life um, and determined to discover her fate. So. Here's something that's a little interesting and, and certainly embarrassing. Um, I talked about auditioning different characters for the role of the reader and how each one of them caused the fictional world to collapse. The characters were different, but the point of collapse was always the same. Okay? It happened just when the character started to become specific and idiosyncratic. In other words, just when the character started exhibiting the qualities that any good fictional character must have. Okay. And at the time, you know, I knew that the character wasn't working, but I was only somewhat aware of why. And so this is the embarrassing part. <laughs> My solution was to try in each subsequent iteration to make the character less specific <laughs> and more generic. 
OK, so I mean, what was I thinking? Good fictional characters have to be specific. They have to be idiosyncratic. They can't be generic. And so finally, what I ended up with in, um, in that terrible first draft was that nameless, genderless, jobless, amorphous character written in the first person so as to avoid a gendered pronoun. In other words, I had written a placeholder. I didn't realize this until much later, but those first iterations of the reader were stand-ins, kind of like the dummy or empty it that can serve as a grammatical subject, enabling me to write now's part of the tale. And they continued to function that way until enough time passed and the conditions of the world changed and the necessary events occurred that pushed me into the fictional world and allowed this particular novel to be written. But the thing is, each of these stand-in readers changed Now's story. Of course, this makes sense, right? A reader always changes the story when, she's, uh, when she reads. We look at this book and we think of it as a, as a fixed object, right? Uh, a Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ozeki. But in fact, once I send the book out into the world and you read it, it is no longer one single book, but rather an array of books that share the same title, but in fact are very different. Right? The novel that, that, that you read is going to be very different than the novel that your neighbor reads. Um, and, and different, too, from the one that I wrote. So you bring your own body-mind experience to it and change it. In this way, a novel is a collaboration, or, or you could say a quantum array. Um, and there are as many different tales for the time being as there are readers. Likewise, the first stand-in readers of Now's diary changed the diary because Now was responding to the reader's interest. To put it in Buddhist terms, Now was dependently co-arising with the readers. So if the reader was a woman interested, say, in, in Japanese fashion, um, Now would write about Japanese fashion. If the reader was a creepy guy with a prurient interest in young girls, then Now would respond by recounting a creepy sexual encounter. The novel is a palimpsest in which traces of these first readers remain. And the last two points um, I want to make before we move on are this. First, that novels can take a long time to write. Um, novels are time beings. They take the time they take. And second, uh, writers are time beings too. They, they come and go. And the Ruth Ozeki who wrote this book is no longer with us. Um, she was a writer who sat alone in a cabin in a rainforest in the Pacific Northwest, dressed in her pajamas, and wrote. The person who is standing in front of you yammering on about writing is not a writer. <laughs> She is something else, um, an author, or heaven help us, a professor. <laughs> the writer writes, the author talks about writing. Very different. Um, so once I decided to put myself, myself in the book, I started reading Dogen differently. In the fascicle Uji, there's this wonderful line, the way the self arrays itself, okay, the way the self arrays itself is the form of the entire world. See each thing in this entire world as a moment of time. Okay. And then later he writes, the self setting itself out in array sees itself. This is the understanding that the self is time. Okay. So this mapped really nicely on my hunch that writing novels, and particularly writing this novel, could be a kind of a performance of the Buddhist idea of no self and impermanence. I was experimenting with the notion of self not as a singular phenomenon existing in a fixed state of being, but rather as an immaterial construct, a fluid array of fictional possibilities. A novel then becomes a kind of open-ended inquiry or thought experiment in which I test this array of different possibilities that I call my characters, putting them in a variety of situations, tweaking the causes and conditions, and seeing what the characters do. Um, describing this, I realize I'm making it all sound very deliberate and conscious, and it's anything but. Um, as Haruki Murakami describes, much of the process of fiction writing happens in a kind of dream state at the bottom of a deep, dark well of the unconscious mind. Um, but since I can't take you there directly, I have to try to describe it in words and language, which has the unfortunate effect of making the creative process seem fixed and rational. It's not. Um, I just want to end. Do we have time? Yeah, we, okay. I just want to end with one of my favorite uh, Do of Dogen's writings. This is Genjo Koan, which uh, Jay referred to um, at the beginning. And Genjo Koan is often, often translated as actualizing the fundamental point. 
In a famous passage, Dogen writes, to study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by the myriad things of the world. When actualized by the myriad things, the body mind of self and the body mind of others drops away. No trace of realization remains, and this no trace continues to express itself endlessly. So I've talked about the self as the starting point of fiction writing. Here, Dogen is explicitly telling us that the self is also the starting point of Zen practice um, and studying the Buddha way. And, and this makes sense. When we meditate, we study ourselves. Our bodies, our breath, our senses, our sensations, our minds, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions as they arise and pass away. We watch the way our thoughts cohere into stories about who we are, you know, what we like, what we don't like, our judgments and fears, I'm this, I'm that, all of these narrative operations through which we create our identity and sense of self. Through meditation, we become aware of the stories we tell, each, uh, tell ourselves about who we are, and we begin to recognize them as stories. Instead of, and instead of grasping onto them for dear life, we hold them just a little bit more lightly. We learn not to mistake our stories for who we are. Um, the verb that, uh, for study that Dogen uses is narao, okay, which means to become accustomed to or become familiar with. And this is different from the idea of to study, which assumes a kind of dualistic relationship between the subject I and the, uh, sorry, the subject I and the object of study, it. Um, when we become accustomed or familiar with something, there's a closeness and intimacy involved. Studying the self is a way of becoming familiar and intimate with our stories about self, which then causes the very convincing feeling of being a self, as separate from the rest of the world, to soften and dissolve. As we relax our grip on the belief in a solid identity, the dualistic separation that we feel between ourselves and each other and the world softens. We start to understand that identity, this self, is nothing more than the, fluid, the fluidity of interdependence, of interbeing with the world and everything around us. To study the Buddha way is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be actualized by the myriad things of the world. Uh, so this, to me, is what writing on a good day feels like. <laughs> This seems to describe what happens in any creative process, be it fiction writing or art making or meditation. You study the self and through that process of growing intimacy, the self and its attendant self-consciousness drops away and the world starts to express itself through you. At that moment, the practice is practicing you. Writers describe this feeling as the writing writing itself. I think this is also what we mean when we talk about creativity as a gift. It's something that we receive. It comes from the world, the myriad things, from beyond our small selves. And having received this gift, it's the artist's job to get out of the way and not let our stories, all of our ego-driven ambition and impatience and neurotic insecurities, to interfere with the process itself. Now, of course, this goes against our basic human nature. <laughs> there's, a funny saying, there's a funny saying about writers, which is that um, writers don't want to write. They want to have written. Um, <laughs> and and this, is, this is true. Um, it's nice to end up with a finished you know, and hopefully publishable novel after many, many years. Um, but the only way to get there is by engaging fully and completely with the practice of writing, no matter how long it takes. Um, Dogen had a very interesting take on meditation practice. He, he taught a kind of meditation he called shikantaza, um, or just sitting. And what makes shikantaza different than other forms of meditation is that it's goalless. Okay? Shikantaza is not about gaining enlightenment or salvation or anything else. It, it's not some kind of you know, personal or spiritual self-improvement plan or a means to an end. Although Dogen doesn't rule out self-improvement either. But Dog in Dogen's view, you don't meditate because you want to become enlightened. You meditate because you're already enlightened. And your meditation is simply a creative expression of that enlightenment. You know, what do Buddhas do? They meditate. Ergo, when you sit down to meditate, you are a Buddha. One Buddhist scholar suggested that Dogen's meditation 
is this, this idea of creative expression of the Buddhahood, right, is a kind of performance art. And this, this comparison delights me. <laughs> um, because likewise, when you sit down to write, you're a writer. The writer is not separate from the act of writing. If the writer does become separate from the act of writing, then she's not a writer, because a writer is someone who writes. Writing, art, music, philosophy, meditation, even, even tidying your room are all creative expressions of your Buddha nature, which is also our human nature, our human heritage. So instead of thinking of creativity as me expressing myself in the world, right, try turning that around. Creativity is the world expressing itself through me. Right? And this takes some of the pressure off. Now all you have to do is show up at your desk, stay curious, receptive, and be OK with not knowing. And you still have to make the effort. Okay? That's important. You still have to make the very best effort you can, even if the practice has no function, no purpose, no goal, and in that sense, is useless. Novels have no real use value either. <laughs> And yet writers sweat blood in order to write them. In our relentlessly goal-oriented, materialist, capitalist, hyper-rational world, working really, really hard at something that is both goalless and useless strikes me as an extremely beautiful, radical, and humane practice. You do it because this is who you are. You do it for the love of it. The last line of Dogen's passage is, when actualized by the myriad things, the body-mind of self and the body-mind of others drop away. No trace of realization remains, and this no trace continues to express itself endlessly. So maybe it's not too crazy or romantic to suggest that the no trace of realization that remains is art, is music, painting, literature, that self-transcending generative impulse to create that's in all of us. This is the point, I think, where Buddhism and fiction writing merge, at least for me. Novels work because we are dependently co-arisen. Literature works because we complete each other. If this were not the case, fiction wouldn't work. And if it didn't work, it wouldn't exist. We wouldn't need it. It's because readers and writers are all so radically interconnected, because we respond to words on the page with our body minds and can be moved by them, because we can slip into other selves and share both our primal confusion and our enlightenment, that literature exists. In this way, the arts all seem to me to be proof of this basic Buddhist truth. Art is the no trace that continues expressing itself endlessly, which we recognize and respond to precisely because of the vast, beautiful, poignant, and eternal truth of our interbeing. Or, as now would say, you wonder about me, I wonder about you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
do you know Chris Abani's work? Chris Abani's great. Um, and Tosh Awe, two wonderful writers, were also participating in this series. Um, and did I want to do this too? And, and I was so happy that, you know, Chris and Tosh were going to do this and, and, and that, you know, they were using the Borges quote that I said yes. And then, after I said yes, I realized, oh my God, now I have to do this, right? I have to actually sit down and write, uh, I can't remember how many words, but a long essay about my face. And, and this just struck me as a, you know, kind of a disaster. I mean, you know, what was I going to do? What was I going to say? Um, and so what I ended up doing, though, was what I usually do when I have a problem like this, which is to sit with it, right? And I had just read that um, Jennifer Roberts article uh, from the uh, Harvard Review um, about the, the power of patience, I guess it was called. And, and so that really inspired me. And that's what gave me the idea of um, sitting down in front of a mirror and studying my face, because Jennifer Roberts is a um, art historian, and she assigns this task to her students. Sit, you know, find a work of art, sit in front of the work of art for three hours, and note what comes up. Note the kinds of, you know, the, the kinds of ideas that, that come to mind. And so I thought I would do the same thing. And, um, and so I did that. I, I, it, was, it was very painful, as, as she, you know, she, she said that she chose three hours because it was, you know, it was a, you know, a length of time that would be a little bit painful. And, and I found it to be quite painful. But in any case, I did that. And then um, based on that, um, I, I, well, actually, I did that. And then I put it aside for about another year or so. And then, because I really didn't want to write this thing. And, um, and then finally, I had to. So I took it out again and started reading it. And of course, all of the little observations in that time code that I had written, right, all the notes that I had written while I was studying my face, um, started to. Um, remind me of other topics, right? And so then I started, and, and a lot of it was about Buddhism, right? Um, and so then I started to bring in the Buddhist elements and you know, the no elements and various other things. Um, so it, it emerged out of the time code itself, out of that initial observation experiment. Um, and then all of the rest of it started to come together. Um, and, and it was, you know, it was interesting because um, one of the things that I didn't realize um, until after the book was published. This was fascinating. Um, you know, so this, I, I, I was worried. I was sitting in front of a mirror, right, you know, at, at my Zen altar, right? And I'd, I'd taken off the Buddha statue and put this, <laughs> put a mirror there instead, right? Um, and, and the Buddha is not a god, right? Uh, so I didn't feel like this was sacrilege or anything like that, but it still felt a little awkward. And, um, but then I, I realized afterwards, I, I learned afterwards that in fact, um, in Japan, um, in the 13th century, there was a temple named uh, called Tokeji. And it was a temple, it was a nunnery. And it was founded by a woman who was a member of the aristocracy. And it was um, the only place in Japan at that time where a woman could get a legal divorce, right? And so um, at the temple, they had this big mirror and they actually practiced something called mirror zen. And a woman would come to the temple, and she apparently would throw her shoes over the temple wall, at which point she would be brought in, right? And her husbands, you know, the husbands would be chasing them, and, you know, um, and, um, and she would be brought in. And then the idea was that she would sit for three years in front of the mirror, right? And, and sitting zazen, sitting meditation in front of the mirror, looking at her image. And in a way, you could think about it as kind of reclaiming her image, at the end of which she was granted a legal divorce. Right. And so I didn't, you know, I didn't know about any of this, but it was, it was fascinating. So apparently there was a historical precedent for what I was doing, um, but I, you know, I didn't know it. And I'm still married, too. So, <laughs> <But> <laughs> so it was interesting. It was a, a kind of an organic you know, process of. Other, other things people want to ask, talk about? Yeah. Was the wonderful character of the grandmother, yeah. Jiko. Jiko, yeah. Based on someone within your family, others you've met? Yeah, she, you know, old Jiko was a kind of a composite character. Um, it, there's certainly a lot of my mother in there. Um, old Jiko was a, uh, you know, she's a, uh, she has that kind of funny sense of humor, right? And, and that was my mom's sense of humor, for sure. Um, but she was also modeled a bit on, you know, Ulgico uh, texts, right? And she texts and uses computers and stuff like that. And that was based on a, um, a story I heard about a, a, a real um, nun, Buddhist nun, um, named Seto Uchi Jakucho. Jakucho is her name. And, um, and Jakucho uh, is a really interesting character. She, she um, was a novelist, uh, is a novelist. She's a writer. 
Um, she was born, I think, in the 30s, perhaps. Um, she was writing during the 50s. She wrote, she was famous in Japan because she, um, she was writing, she, she wrote really kind of risque novels, um, writing about sex from a woman's point of view, which, which just really wasn't happening at the time. And so the, the you know, mostly male literati, you know, uh, dubbed her a pornographer, and, and so there was all this controversy about her life. Um, in any case, when she was 50, she had a, a, a nervous breakdown, and, um, and she decided that she couldn't continue writing unless she could find a backbone. Right, and I think this, it, it really reminded me of the Haruki Murakami quote about going to those dark places in yourself and needing a way out. I think for her, and, and certainly for me too, you know, the Zen practice is what gives me the backbone to, to do the work, right? In any case, she, she shaved her head and became, uh, you know, ordained and became a nun, right? And she pretty much gave up uh, writing. And um, now she's, she's still alive. She's, um, she's, not, uh, she's not as old as old Jiko. She's, you know, young. She's like 96 or something. Um, but she is a, she's an amazing person. And she, um, she, at one point in Japan, cell phone novels were really very, very popular. Like women were writing, you know, girls especially were, you know, writing novels on their cell phones and they'd upload them to the cloud and then they'd download them on their phones and, you know, and read them. And this was this big thing. And, um, and Jakucho decided that if that's what, if that's what young people were doing, then she would need to, you know, she would need to learn to write cell phone novels too, right? And so she did. Um, she's also uh, most famous, I think, in Japan because she did a, a wonderful um, contemporary, a modern Japanese translation of the tale of Genji right once again sort of focusing on the you know the the experiences of the women in tale of Genji and um, and I really she she's she was very politically active after the um, earthquake and tsunami when Japan was um, starting to open up the nuclear reactors again she was you know on the picket lines um, she did a hunger strike um, you know to protest this um, and she, she's just a really very political figure um, uh, and, and she's, she's funny, too. One, a reporter at one point asked her if she ever, um, you know, if she ever uh, regretted taking the tonsure, you know, um, uh, shaving her head and becoming a, a celibate nun. And, and she said, well, you know, if, if I'd known that I was going to live this long, I, m I might have waited. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> So she's a she's kind of a remarkable, wonderful character. So she was definitely part of the yeah part of part of my inspiration for old Chico. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Carol. <laughs> Can you say anything? I know you're mostly being a professor now. Mm. Can you say anything about what you're working on next? Mm. <laughs> Where is time and writing? <laughs> I can't remember. It's been so long. <laughs> no, I'm working on another. I'm working on another. I'm working on another novel. Um, not right this minute, but I am working on another novel, um, and it's. Um, let's see now. In, in some ways, you know, I don't want to say it's a companion piece to a tale for the time being because that would give you the wrong idea. Um, but I guess in my mind, I sort of think of it that way a little bit. Um, it's it's a it's a, a story that's sort of inspired by a Dogen fascicle again, um, called um, "Insentient Beings Speak the Dharma." Okay, insentient beings speak the Dharma, and so I'm very interested in this idea of um, you know of of insentient matter, you know, and and the vibrancy. Of, of matter. And the, uh, just very briefly, the, the story revolves around um, a, a mother and a, a son. Um, and the little boy, um, uh, around the age of puberty, starts to hear, well, I should say, first of all, the mother is, a, is um, the mother is a bit of a hoarder. She becomes kind of a hoarder. And the little boy um, starts to hear the voices of the things in the house starting to speak to him. Right, starting to, to speak, and so you know, the, the it's a story about the uh, you know about their relationship. So, is that enough? <laughs> yeah, Gail. Um, Ruth, when you were talking about uh, the um, sort of the function of literature yeah. as useless and, and necessary at the same time, I, I really was called to mind this quote, which I yeah. mentioned thanks to the miracle of the internet. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, at this second. Uh, by the writer Janet Malcolm, 
mm. um, when she's writing about psychoanalysis. Mm. And she says, uh, the crowning paradox of psychoanalysis is the near uselessness of its insights. To make the unconscious conscious, the program of psychoanalytic therapy, this is the key part, is to pour water into a sieve. The moisture that remains on the surface of the mesh is the benefit of analysis. That's <laughs> great. I, 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 I love that. that. I love that. that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel yep. Like I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly yeah. 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 I agree. And there's something very beautiful about this to me. You know, this idea that you would go through all of this effort to try to understand in psychoanalysis, you know, who is this? What is this? What's going on? Right. And, 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 but for what? Right. You know. And, and certainly the same is true for literature. I mean, there's no, thank goodness there's no use value to it, you know? I mean, that would, that would make it into something that it's not. So thank you, that's great. <laughs> Send that to me, will you? <laughs> yeah. You may have asked this question before, but yeah. you mentioned Murakami. Yeah. How much do you feel like Murakami has influenced your writing? Um, I don't know whether he's influenced my writing. He gives me courage, you know? He gives me courage to, to be wacky, you know. Um, I, I always wanted to, I, I, I'm a pretty, um, what, reality-based person. I, I, I don't have a, you know, uh, I don't have that kind of wild imagination that he does. Um, and, and I, but I am inspired by it. And, um, and I remember that, um, you know, the first two books are, are very, you know, quote, realistic books. Um, and I, but I've always loved, um, I've always loved, you know, sort of magical realism, what's called magical realism, right? And I remember reading um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you know, 100 Years of Solitude and thinking, oh my God, that's what I want to do. I want to do, I want magic to happen like that. But I, I'm, you know, as I said, just a very kind of quotidian person. Um, and, I, and I didn't know how to do it, right? Um, but I remember thinking with A Tale for the Time Being, I knew that there had to be magic in it. I knew that this magical moment had to happen. And <clears throat> I remember I was getting, you know, I was writing the book and I was getting closer and closer and closer and closer to the moment when this thing had to happen, this magic had to happen, right? And, and it was like this wall, right, that I was getting closer to and closer to. And finally I was there, right? And I, I just had no idea how I was going to do it. And, and, and then I started writing and then, you know, there was no wall, right? There was no, there was nothing there. It was just, you just write it. <laughs> you write it and it happens, right? I mean, it was kind of amazing. So, you know, which is a kind of a tangent to, to your question, but you know, it was definitely this idea. Murakami is so, so wild and so free that, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Wow, yes. Really, um, yes. 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 And the temptation is to just be discouraged and to feel like, oh wow, I wasted. I just wasted five years, right? But that's that's not what happened. You know, every single one of those readers left his or her mark on the text, right? On the on the story, and um, you know, and it's invisible to it's it, most of that would be invisible to to you know to to readers who read this book, you know. But I can I can see it. I can see it. I know where it is, right? So it's interesting. It's, it's, or, or maybe that's just a story I'm telling myself to make myself feel better for being such an inefficient writer. You know, that's possible too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Most of the, the translations of Uji that I've run into yeah. is becoming Italian. Oh, nice. I like that. I yeah. felt like, well, Ojiko already was well into becoming Italian. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering if that was something yeah. that you were deliberately doing. Yeah. Or it, it, it just felt very powerful. <coughs> it, yeah. 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 Well, as the story sort of unfolded. Yeah. 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 Um, that's really interesting. Um, I hadn't thought about that as a, as a, you know, but then again, I, you know, I was going to say, I hadn't thought about that as a deliberate strategy. But then again, as you probably can tell, I don't have that many deliberate strategies when I write. Um, I, you know, the, the writing is coming from some other, you know, some other place. And, um, and so uh, I didn't actually 
have that as a, you know, as a, as a conscious thought. Um, although I certainly did know that old Chico was going to die, right? And in that sense, you know, I, I think on some level I had this feeling that old Chico would... Even the way she lived yeah. her life. Yeah. Already. Yeah. Completely yeah. Different. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. 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 And I think, you know, I was also very, um, you know, during the process of, of writing this, um, I was taking care of my mother who had Alzheimer's, right? And, um, and so, you know, this was a, a time being who was, you know, moving into time. I mean, she, you know, she couldn't, it was fascinating because she, you know, she couldn't remember what had happened yesterday, but she could remember things that happened in her childhood, right? And, um, and, and so, you know, that was a, you know, I mean, I, I did that for years. And, um, and that, I think, very much informed, um, informed the book. Um, and, and so, yeah. She was definitely a time being, sort of, you know, merging back into time. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. I just, um, I feel so upset. Um, I want to <laughs> share with you what yeah. happened in my mind at the very beginning of your talk. Yeah. Because you oh, good. Because all come up to the podium. Yeah. And then the, the room felt unbalanced to me. So, there, so every chair was filled with you. Oh, how great. <laughs> Thank you. And you were, you, you ever, ever, yeah. ever need some extra help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All my characters, you know. Yeah, we were there that's great. You and you were wiping off the sweaty hands. Yeah, doing, yeah. You know, Thank you. That's great. That's great. The image in my mind. That's I great. <laughs> that's great. It's well, it's yeah. It's well, it's that's that's what these are, right? That's what these books yeah. are. So it was a very, you know, it was a very sort of prescient, you know, <laughs> imagining there. That's great. That's great. Good. Any other? Yeah. Thank you. Fascinating talk I've ever been. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well. Thank you. Well, let's stop there because how can I beat that? Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Jay. Thank you all for coming. And thanks once again to everybody who made these possible. And we'll see you again in the spring when Kate Lila Wheeler comes up. Great. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.